Welcome to another edition of From the Press Box on this May 3rd, 2021. My name is Rob Leonard. Joining me, of course, is my brother and co-host, award-winning sports writer, Tim Leonard. Good morning, brother. How are you? Good morning, brother. I'm outstanding. How about yourself? That's great to hear. We should say that our good friend J.P. Pelsman will be calling in uh, sometime in the next 20 minutes or so to talk about the draft, especially the Jets, as he is the Jets beat writer for Forbes.com. And uh, we look forward to talking to J.P. as always. Um, you know, because, you know, J.P.'s funny and we like J.P. He's a friend uh, of the show. A friend of the show, we should say that. And uh, I'm trying to figure out where we should start first, brother. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do this for you so we can make sure we get it in. What the hell happened with uh, Manchester and Liverpool, brother? Let's start off with soccer. We never well, start Man- off with soccer. Man- Manchester United, brother. Let's, let's point Man- that I'm out because there are, there are two Manchesters. Oh, okay. that's like that's like two oh. teams in New York, Mets and Yankees. Exactly. Um, so, okay, so, what happened with Manchester United and Liverpool? Well, for for, for anybody who, who who didn't hear, and 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 you know, obviously, uh, you know, depending on how how much you're into soccer, uh, you may not have heard. But a, there was well, this a, is a this is a, a beyond uh, soccer story because oh yeah, without a doubt, it involves fans and the and the, and protesting. So, you know. And this, this of- went this went far beyond protesting. Um, right. What what happened yesterday was uh, the Manchester United fans wanted to protest against their ownership. Uh, the team is owned by by the Glazer family, which is the same family that owns the Tampa Bay Buccaneers of the NFL. Uh, but they have owned Manchester United for approximately fifteen years, maybe maybe a couple of years more. Um, and the Manchester United fans don't like the fact that Americans own their club. They never have. They never will. But the problem that happened recently, and we've talked about this for for a couple of weeks now, brother, is the European Super League. Now, the Glazers are being blamed as a major instigator of that league. Uh, And and a lot of Europeans saw the European Super League as a way to Americanize uh, football in, in, in Europe. Because it had guaranteed places, and and you couldn't, you fifteen teams couldn't be relegated, so you were guaranteed to make money, and that's that's they saw it as as a, a greed, you know, money grab from greedy owners, and and it was it was uh, going away from the tradition of promotion and relegation for European clubs. So the fans gathered yesterday to protest before the Manchester United Liverpool match, which is one of the, one of the top matches of the premier league season, because it's two rival clubs. They're, they're not that far away from each other. And they are two of the more successful clubs in, in premier league history. So when, when, you know, when you look at that and a protest and they protested the ownership more so the ownership than the Super League, because the Super League is done, but it, they've used that cause uh, as, as a rallying cry for their latest round of protests. But what happened this time, instead of just protests, people were throwing bottles, uh, they were throwing rocks and coins and stuff, and they, were, they weren't just throwing it aimlessly. They were throwing it at their own fans, first of all. People, the Manchester United fans were getting hit with bottles. They were throwing them at police. Which, which had to be called in. I don't know why there were no police at this, a, a, a protest that was planned for more than a week. Why there right. were police there already. They were just, they were just, you know, stadium stewards there. These, these people aren't prepared, you know, or, or, or capable of handling riot, or handling riots or protests. So, and, and they were throwing, uh, they were throwing bottles at horses too, because the cops over there, they ride on horses a lot of times. So, so these idiots are throwing bottles and, 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 you know, whatever at horses as well. And what happened was a couple of hours before the game, one, the report that I heard was that a gate was, was ripped off of, of its, uh, you know, of its, uh, what's, uh, hinges, hinges, the hinges and people, people streamed into the stadium. Now the players weren't there yet. The players were still in their hotel. Liverpool hadn't gotten there yet. It was it was like it was at least three hours before the game. But here come these fans in, into the stadium, down the stairs. They're they're damaging seats. They damaged uh, uh, the the uh, coverings that they've had on the seats now because of the COVID because they don't want people sitting there. And they just stormed onto the field. They started kicking a ball around. They they were they were damaging all kinds of equipment. They were damaging the, the grass. 
uh, there were cameras there because the game was supposed to be on television on on, uh, on NBCSN yesterday. They were throwing they were throwing equipment, breaking it, damaging it. It, it was just it was it reminded me, and, and I hated to see this. It reminded me of the insurrection at the Capitol on January sixth. It was the same kind of idiots doing damage just to do damage, and and it, it did nothing to to uh, ingratiate me to to their cause. Or, or to make me support them. In fact, it did just the opposite. Because I, you know, I'm all for protest. I, I have no problems with protest at all. If somebody feels that strongly about something and they want to protest, hey, fine, I'll probably, well, I'll probably wind up supporting them. But when you go to criminal behavior, you just lost me. I'm, I'm, I'm not. You know, that, that's the line where I draw. If you can protest, do whatever you want, as far as I'm concerned. But the second you go into criminal activity, you're no longer protesting. That that that's that's beyond. Oh, that's true. That's true. That's I mean, beyond. It, and, it, uh, and to go in and continue. damage your own stadium. Yeah, how why would stupid, you do that? How yeah, stupid I mean, do you have to be? And the, the the estimates were that there were probably somewhere close to a thousand people who, who who got into the stadium and onto the grounds. Now there was one guy in particular who he threw a camera tripod. He was all over the field. He was tearing stuff up. The, and and the the one thing about this guy was he needed to pull up his pants. All all you could see was was, was the, the the jeans were were like midway up his butt. And wow. I, I hope he gets banned for life because this guy will be easy to recognize. He didn't have a mask on, nothing. I mean, and they still have COVID protocols over over in Britain. You know, it's it's not it, they're they're not as as vaccinated as we are here yet. Uh, they they still they still are you know probably. Uh, at least a few weeks, if not months, behind us as far as vaccinations go, uh, and and you know they just I think they just got out of another lockdown, so we're ahead of them as far as all that goes. So they they there was there was definitely breaking of COVID protocols, and it just it was stupid. It was just absolutely stupid because how how do you, I, you know I understand fine you want the Glazers to sell the team, but you think this is going to do it? No, and and this isn't like uh, the Wilpons. Where people, you know, asking them to sell a team for years, they weren't going to sell a team at that point, and and the Glazers aren't going to sell, you know, a very valuable team. Let's be honest: if you own a Premier League team, you're going to make some money, and it's a, it's you know, it's just something that they're not going to get rid of. You want to get rid of it? You, you you get someone to come in and offer them, you know, a lot of money, like Uncle or, Stevie or, did for for the Wilpons, or your boycott. Those are the two ways to do anything. Right. And, and the Manchester United fans, I haven't seen anybody boycotting. The stadium's no, full no. the whole time. You're right. So, so e- and, either organize your fans and say, hey, we need to boycott and we need to stop paying for tickets and, and giving them all this money. Because the the, the, the the perception over there, even though I don't understand it because it's completely false, but the perception there is that the Glazers own Manchester United so they that, that the revenue from that club supports the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. No, which it's not true. Of, which is such a load of crap. But it's like they, like I said, they 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 despise Americans. In, in, well, in, I can in, understand in that. It's despise it's, them. Yeah, you know, they don't want the to Nets. see American players. They don't want to see American managers. They, they certainly yeah, but don't want Tim, to see American it's owners. It's like when the the Nets are owned by the uh, Russian oligarch guy. I forgot his name. Um, but yeah, Pro- what, what's Prokhorov. he doing owning? Yeah, what is he doing owning the Nets? I mean, he might even actually have a, a bit left. I don't even he know. He wanted but. to spend money. I didn't have a problem with him owning the Nets. The guy was, was a <laughs> yeah. was a I think, I think uh, the NBA maybe should investigate how he got that billion dollars. Well, yeah, we know how he got it, but that's yeah. not, that's besides the point. But Manchester United spends pretty much as almost as much as any club in the world. So so right. the whole the whole gripe about you know it, it's it basically it comes back to entitlement. Because Manchester City, Manchester United won so many times with, with Alex Ferguson as the manager, and ever since he he retired, they haven't done anything. Right, right. You know, they they won a couple of cups. So what? They haven't won the league once since Fergie stepped down, and that and that's the entitlement of the Manchester United fans. They're like, well, why aren't we winning every year anymore? Sounds they're like Yankee fans, they're, brother. They're, they're, no, they're not at all, brother. Not at all. Really? You sure? Not entitlement in Yankee positive. fans? Positive. These these people these people I mean first of all like this year they're in second place and for for the last few years they they've you know they're just as likely to miss the Champions League and miss the top four as they were to be in it so they're just another team now 
you know, they have you have to deal with the fact that you had a legendary manager, probably probably one of the best managers in in, in the history of the sport. He's not there anymore. Right, right. So, so yeah, your your team is going to suffer in some way. You're you're going to get knocked down a peg or two. But, well, but one this thing, this one, is not the way to do it. And and bringing right. in a new well, owner certainly isn't 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 a guarantee uh, as far as as far as spending the kind of money the fans the fans want it, the fans don't care. The fans are like, oh, it costs a hundred plus million pounds. So what? Spend it. it. It's like you know, dude. There's financial fair play rules at play here. You know, there, there's other rules. There's also, you, you know, the teams also want to make some kind of a profit. They don't want to just dump 400 million pounds and say, oh, all right, well, it's just a loss. Don't worry. The fans are happy. Well, Tim, I think part of it is, is that um, in the NFL, it's very much socialism. And people forget that, that there's going to be a guaranteed profit somewhere along the line. You might make a little more money from other things. But basically, every team is guaranteed a profit. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. And. You know, in in football over there, they'll just spend any amount of money they can and will. And it's a different well, I mean, attitude. There, there's no salary cap. You can spend whatever you want right. to spend but as long as long as the, the the supposedly and we talked about how this rule has no teeth. But the out the outgoing spend is, is the outgoing sell is supposed to equal the incoming spend. So. That it's called financial fair play rule. That's why that came from FIFA, but it, it's it's rarely enforced the way it should be. Otherwise, sure. you wouldn't have you wouldn't have teams like like PSG and, and Barcelona and Manchester City and being able to buy every player they want. Well, so I mean that's 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 the main issue. They, now they have to reschedule this game because they they were, they thought they might be able to get the game in, but there was no way they were going. As soon as the, as soon as the fans got on the field, there was no way that game was going to be played yesterday. Well. One thing, brother, about protests in sports, everyone says, oh, we shouldn't go, we should protest. I, I find that if you like a team, you just don't stop liking them because, you know, I, you know, oh, we got to protest. You know, it's like the, the people who said, well, I'm not watching the NFL anymore because Colin Kaepernick. No, you watch the they NFL, lied. you watch the they Super lied. Bowl. They lied. Even Trump lied. You know, he had parties in Mar-a-Lago for the Super Bowl after saying he was going to protest. So, I mean... um, yeah, you know, I find that people say that, but they never do it, especially with sports. You know, right. for but other that, things, if that's maybe. the case, if you're so infuriated by your club that that you are willing to go on the field and tear the place up, tear up your own home stadium, you know what? Find a new club. Yeah, I agree. That's a good point. You know, find a new club because because you're not you're not a real fan. You know, and, and, and these people are just like the quote unquote patriots who went into the Capitol building. They think they they think of themselves as like super fans, and they're defending yeah. the club. No, you're an you're an idiot. Yeah, well, um, and it's interesting how all these uh, 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 you know HD cameras that they have on the phones now can you know focus in on actually what the oh, face they, looks they showed, like. They showed so many people on the pitch yesterday. I can't wait until the arrests start. Yeah, well, uh, you know, hopefully the. Uh, they, they have a good enough people like the FBI who has the, the technology to find these people. Anyway, bro, let's uh, continue on. We're waiting for J.P. Pelsman to call in and talk about the Jets and the NFL draft. Um, the Islanders uh, have clinched a playoff spot. Uh, they beat the, the Rangers 3 to nothing, And then uh, they also beat the Rangers 4 to nothing at the Garden a couple of days earlier. Uh, this is most likely, which we should say, this is, or this was, the last Rangers Islanders game at Nassau Coliseum. Uh, the history. I was really surprised that um, there wasn't a bigger story about this. Um, because, well, the, you know, a, I mean, because the history of you know going to the Coliseum to you know, I mean, there was a time that when the Islanders weren't doing good, there would be more Ranger fans than Islander fans. Yeah, it's, and, it's, you know, it's, it, we're, we're getting a new house, so. Yeah, I know, but I, I, it is a Coliseum. I don't, I don't think it should be a bigger story. It's, it's, it's well, I'm, you know, I mean, I'm, I, I, you're, you're, you're way more uh, sentimental about this stuff than I am. It's like I they've am. needed, they've needed a new home for many years. Right. Uh, the I, Coliseum I'm not saying is otherwise. a substandard building. Yeah. So and they, and, I, I, and my I'm, prediction, I'm, brother, my yes. prediction, brother, is that within uh, the next three years, the Coliseum is knocked down. It wouldn't surprise me. I don't know you what know, they can it, use it for. And what because, they would use it for? Because the people who are going to run it gave it up. They said, well, we can't do anything anymore. And it seems all connected to the Barclays Center and the new UBS arena. Right. Well, when it comes up. So it's, um, somebody, I look somebody at it, it's, it's all, it almost looks like it was a plot, except it wasn't because it wasn't 
that's this thought out. So, well, um, somebody, somebody's either going to buy the land and, and build condos or, or apartments. No, there won't be. Whatever. It'll be business. It'll be businesses. Well, there, you, or, know, you, know, you know what? You know what? Also, wouldn't surprise me. And I, I don't know what I don't know what their finances are, but I wouldn't surprise me if Hofstra brought it and, to, and, and built some dorms or something over there. Nah, they, they already have a um, well, some sort of a testing facility. Not testing facility. There's, there is already something built there. I forgot what it is, but you, if you wow. pass it on Hempstead Turnpike right before Hofstra, actually, there is a built new building there. So um, you know, it cuts into the parking lot. But I can see in the next three years the Coliseum being knocked down. Yeah, um, I can see it. You know, so it's that's and that's unfortunate. Um, anyway, brother. So the Islanders are in the playoffs. Um, my prediction is they're going to the finals. Uh, yes, they have to beat up on the Capitals and the I, Penguins. I, I, I still think you, with, with recent results, brother. I think you're being optimistic. I, 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 I am I being hope, optimistic. I hope you're right, but I, I'm I'm not seeing it in in, in recent weeks. They're beat, they're beating the bad teams and they're losing to the good teams. And it's, yeah, it's they, been going it's been going on for for a good month now. Yeah, well, you're right. They lost to the Capitals a couple of times when they maybe shouldn't have. And um, well, they you know. lost to the Capitals three three in a row. They lost to the Capitals yeah. like, like a week or so ago. And and you know that was you know it, like it's it's nice to beat the Rangers two games in a row by a combined score of seven nothing. Which, by the way, the Islanders have nine shutouts this year. That's that's astounding. Uh, and, and NHL league leading nine shutouts. Uh, but before those those two games. The Islanders lost one nothing in a shootout to the Capitals. Then it was a six three loss, and then a one nothing loss in regulation. So in two of the three games against the Capitals, they didn't score. I, I mean, that's you know, obviously you're not going to win games if you can't score. And you know, and then to give up six goals, I mean, that's that's not even that's not even an Islander type of performance. You give up six goals, I mean, that's ridiculous. Yeah. But you know, obviously the Capitals are a team that the Islanders could certainly run into in the playoffs. Um, they, they also haven't played well against the Pittsburgh Penguins at all. I mean, they, I think they've won one out of six games against the Penguins. Horrible against the Penguins. Yeah. Horrible. So those, those, they're going to run into one of those two teams, and they're going to have to figure out a way to win, which they haven't figured out at all this season. You know, I mean, the Islanders have five games left. Two of them against the Devils. Two against the Sabers and, and the finale is against the Bruins. The Islanders would win all, all four against the Devils and the Sabers. Those two teams are terrible. So they could still make a run up to second place. I don't think I don't think they'll catch the Penguins for first, but figure they're going to win at least four of those last five games, and maybe all five of them, depending on what the Bruins do. So right, right. you know, I mean, we have to look at it as you know, the Islanders certainly could 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 put themselves in good position from a seeding standpoint, but they need to be able to win those games against the tough teams. And I'm not sure yeah, I see that well, happening this season. I, um, I thought they'd be more, a little more together after they made those trades. And it seems that they're not all together there yet, but they're getting there. I think, I think it's, I think it's going to be a good playoff run for the, for the Islanders brother. We have JP Pelsman on with us as uh, we are going to talk about the just draft and the and giants too, because he's, uh, the Jets beat writer, but he also follows the NFL, too. He writes for Forbes.com. Welcome back to From the Press Box, J.P. Pelsman. J.P., what's up? Hey, Leonard, brothers. Good to be here. Hey, how we doing today, man? Yeah, we, we're, we're seeing you on Zoom because that's how we're getting to the station. New, new beard there, J.P.? What? Hey, we're all, we're all uh, not... Uh... <laughs> Look at that beard, man. Look, at, it's almost like a Tim Leonard beard. We're all, we're all doing yours. a pandemic look at, beard these days. Look at you! Look at yours, Rob. I mean, uh, yeah, I know, man. But this is like a couple of a, weeks, man. That's a standard. Uh, for him. A couple of weeks looks like a couple of months, but uh, uh, anyway, yeah. okay. uh, uh, hey, well, it's the uh, at least I don't have a Zach Wilson headband. So uh, now, now let's start there. Are you shocked, my friend, that the Jets picked Zach Wilson? Come on! Oh yeah, nobody, nobody saw it coming. I didn't see that coming. <laughs> Well, it was funny. Uh, I got to say, one of the writers had a great point, uh, guys. Uh, the, the week before, uh, when Joe Douglas had his pre-draft presser, it was peppering him, and he kept saying, he, had, he said, uh, well, I'm not going to give away the answers to our test. I don't know why everyone – but also, by the way, guys, let's face it. Why do they have to spend – why do both the Jaguars and the Jets have to spend the whole time – all their, their minutes allotted on the yeah, clock? 10 minutes. 
Just could've, come on. Just give the pick. We know who you're taking. Could have could have saved 18 minutes on deadline there. Exactly. <laughs> and but but when they asked him about Zach Wilson, he kept saying, "Well, I'm not going to say anything." But you saw this. Uh, uh, you know what kind of eating grin on his face when he was. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure Joe would have had was a little smirked up. Exactly. It was a big. If you go back and look at it's like on the on on YouTube, you can see the grin on his face. I mean, he wasn't fooling anyone. And hey, I don't have a problem with the pick. I mean, the arm strength is there, the mobility is there. I mean, I think the two biggest questions, guys. Number one, let's face it, he can deflect it all he wants, but. He played some big time competition uh, in 2019. He beat Tennessee on the road, comeback win, beats USC at home. But 2020, let's face it, I mean, uh, what would Dick Vitale say? Cupcake City, baby. Exactly. <laughs> and, well, and then, coastal, coastal Carolina and what, Texas State? Or and something lost to Coastal Carolina, which was the best team he faced. I mean, and, and, and then the other thing is, let's face it, I mean, uh, Believe me, I wish I had his body. I need to lose some weight, but uh, a lot of weight. But, you know, he needs to put on some muscle mass. But the point is, can he put on the muscle mass without getting too muscle bound up top? I mean, the young man needs to protect himself because he's had shoulder surgery. You got to be able to take those hits in the NFL. So, those to me are the two questions. Can he? I mean, everyone, all the scouts say he can process, which, you know, I hate to say it, but. their previous guy couldn't do well. That's why he's now in Charlotte. Uh, Darnold could never get to his second read. I mean, I don't want to rehash that all, but I mean, these people who are saying, oh my God, goodness, they should have stayed with him. Well, that was his problem. He just couldn't. I mean, I could show you tape after tape, guys, where there's a guy wide open and he just doesn't see him. Now they, there, yeah. they say that's not Wilson's problem, but like I said, to me, his biggest problems are can he handle the jump up in competition, and can he put enough weight on him so that not uh, uh, he's not going to be injury prone? Well, what, my question, Joe well, tell me, tell me, hold on a second. I got one more question for JB. Right, right, right. <laughs> do, do, do the Jets have uh, the front line to protect him? Do they have the people to say, okay, he's not going to get hit? Well, or, you know, well, I, well, thanks for saying that, asking that, Rob. That's what I want to get to. Is I mean, they certainly you know, address that with the next pick, although they did uh, take away a, 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 our fa- uh, use up at one of the favorite uh, catchphrases of this season, the draft capital. They <laughs> took two third round picks. To draft get- capital became like load management. <laughs> exactly. Got, oh, you got it, Tim. Yeah. I mean, how many times did we hear that in the last couple of months? Draft capital. Well, all that draft capital Joe Douglas amassed, he used two third-round picks. And this is unusual. I mean, nobody. I looked it up. Nobody had, had, and thank you, Wikipedia, nobody had used, nobody had moved up within the first round. Now, teams had jumped up from the second round. But nobody had had jumped up within the first round, within the first round since 2004 to get a guard. So this is unusual. You do it to get tackles, not guards. But, this yeah, right. but I, 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 I get what you're saying, but I, I know that, I mean, this he, played, he played, he played he tackle. Miss. Yeah. He played tackle last year at USC and the Jets already have a left tackle. So he's, and, he's and, never and, going and also, to play left tackle. And also, yeah. And I get it. And also he is, I know there's no, listen, there's no such thing as can't totally can't miss. I mean, right. even, I hate to tell people, I mean, it's not likely, but Trevor Lawrence could miss. It's not impossible. Right. He's as close, but this, this young man, Elijah Vera Tucker, he is as close to can't miss as it gets. He got like almost a near perfect grade from the scouts, like allowed almost no pressures the last two years. I mean, I don't think he allowed any sacks. He allowed like a handful of pressures. I mean, yeah, coming coming into the draft, he was regarded as the safe, maybe one of the safest picks, one correct. of the three safest picks in the, the draft. Top, the top guard on the board. The Jets said Douglas said he had he had a top ten grade. That's why they tried to get him. But the point I'm making, guys, is he needs to be with what they gave up to get him. And as you said, Tim, one of the safest picks on the board. He doesn't need to – sounds like a Mike thing. He needs to be great. Not, he needs to be yeah. a pro bowler. Yeah. He needs to play at that level. By the way, Tim, that's uh, four, four and a half minutes to the first Mike Francesa reference from uh, JP. So. <laughs> so. 
Yeah, so if you took the uh, under, you, you cashed. Good job. Good job, Mikey. Good point, Rob. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but he needs to be a perennial pro bowler. He can't just be, oh, he's okay. He's, you know, he's a decent starter. He needs to be. Yeah. I, I get what you're saying. But but the other the other part of that, and, and for me, which, what made it such a good pick is that they already have Becked in there. So so sure. now you're look you're you're looking at, at the left side of your line for the next decade. Well, let me just I don't want to throw cold war on that. The only thing I want to say is this. I think it's an important year for Beckton because he needs to get the weight down a little bit. Because I will say this, if this had been a year ago, they might not have made that pick. And it's nothing against Makai Beckton. But the 49er, this Shanahan system, they favor smaller, quicker tackles. Right. The guys the 49ers had last year. Trent Williams and Mike McGlinchey played at 320 and 315 respectively. Now, don't get me wrong. Beckton, for his size, is freakishly quick. Yes. They play that, you know, that outside zone run. And I'll get to that in a minute with Mike, the first Michael Carter. Uh, they outside zone thing, and you want these quick tackles. Don't get me wrong. He is incredibly quick for 350, 360 pounds, but he needs to try to stay within the 350 pounds. I mean, I heard guys supposedly he was up to 380 at one point last year. He can't beat that. Yeah, no, he he he. That he that was the danger that they said that they talked about him when he got drafted last year was that you want to make sure that this guy doesn't eat his way out of the league. Yeah, I mean, he, you know, I know his mom is a good his mom's a good cook, but he's got to lay lay off that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Stay 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 with two plates instead of three or four. Yeah, I mean, he could listen. I think he can. Some people say three forty. I think he could play at three fifty, but not at three eighty. No. That's, I think, why he kept getting injured last year. You can't carry all that weight in the NFL. I'm sorry. Exactly, exactly. And especially when you're getting hammered on every week, like, like you know, like, like they are in the trenches. And uh, especially left tackle. Yeah, JP. I wanted just to to, to get just a, a general uh, what your thoughts were about the draft. I mean, obviously, you know, uh, Wilson is, is was the pick everybody expected, and and uh, you know, fingers crossed was was a good pick. Uh, but just overall, it, it seemed like a strange draft because the, the first four picks were offense, and then what was it, five, five or six? I don't even remember how many picks the Jets had. But every everything else after that was defense. So uh, I'm wondering what you thought. What what was your your grade for for what uh, what Joe Douglas did over I think, over? The three days? I think you have to grade it pretty high, guys. I think the thing was, I think they did let the. I don't think it was. I know Rob was kind of getting at this. I understand what you're saying, Rob, and I think there's truth to it that they want to take care of Wilson the way they didn't take care of Darnold. And like I said, I think both are true. I don't, very good, but I don't think the Jets did the most they could to help them. So I think both things can be true at the same time. But I don't think it was just, oh, we got to take care of Zach the way we can take care of Sam. I do believe, Douglas, what he says, this is the way they're born. I mean, they saw Elijah Moore sitting at – at the third or the second round, and they said they had a top twenty-five grade on them, and they said no, we got to go this way. Uh, but I will say that I, I think Salah. It's hard. I've heard him pronounce so many different ways. Yeah. He'll pronounce it Salah like salad, so I'll go with that. I've heard Salah. I, I, so I'll go with. How does Sal- he pronounce it? <laughs> yeah, you know, we got to ask him that. So the problem with Zoom, you just don't see everyone. You know, you don't see people in person. Where you can just pull them aside. Yeah, and- that's true. How do you pronounce it? But uh, but he does seem like a chill guy. He seems like a great guy. I'm really impressed by him. Yeah, so far what I've seen is, has been positive. Yeah, I mean, if I could just quick aside, like somebody asked him the question, like, because he's been a defensive mind coach, obviously, his whole career. Somebody asked him uh, on night one, somebody, or no, night two, like, like uh, do you want them to start picking some defensive players? And uh, I don't know, it was the first night, because the two, uh, first two guys were offense. And he's like, hey, I coach them all. Whereas, like, Rex would have been like, ooh, uh, yeah, where are they going to pick some players on defense? And to me, that's the right attitude. Because, like, look at Gase. Like, Gase is like the defensive guys were like, you know, the redheaded stepchildren. You know, it's like they. I think they needed that guy to have a guy who coaches the whole team, not this – you know, but anyway, that's an aside. But getting back yeah. to the- I, I could I could see Rex if it was if it was the opposite, if it or if, if this was Rex coaching this team, he would he would have said something to the effect of like, Oh, when they when are they gonna get when are they gonna get me some toys? Exactly. I mean so. this is the guy where there was times Sanchez would throw a pick six, Rex had his back turned. I mean, come on. You know, because <laughs> he was coaching up the defense. I mean, listen, 
If you're Belichick, you can get away with that because you're Belichick. You can't do it when you know you don't have any rings. But right. anyway, I think that's the way the board fell. I also think I looked this up too. Speaking of 2004, 2004 was the last time the 49ers organization picked a corner higher than the third round. And I think Salah, Salah, Salah kind of got into that mode. I think, I'm not saying I agree with it, but I think part of it was I think he told these guys, listen, I think take up, if you take, if we take quarters in the later rounds, we can coach them up and eventually they'll be good. I'm not saying I agree with that, but that might be the thinking here. It, it's, it's, it shows that, that he's got some confidence in himself and his staff. Yeah. That, that, that he's willing to do that. And, and he's willing to say, you know, stick with the board. We don't have to, we don't have to reach for people. Go with the best guy because obviously the offense needs whole, a whole lot of help. But you know, for for them to go, I mean, they they went all defense with with the later picks, and and you know, there, there are a couple of guys, and I'll I'll ask you about a couple of them in a, in a, in a little bit. Um, but you know, I mean, I got to say, I talk a little bit about about Elijah Moore because I love this pick, and and I think I think this kid is, is he's he's just he's a home run hitter that the Jets haven't had in years. And, and yeah, he's he's kind of small, but dude is a blur. And and to me, it's just get the ball in his hands and let him do do what he does. Um, you know, much in the same way that that Kadarius Tony is for for you know the guy the Giants picked at number twenty. They sound like very similar players. Well, that's what Salah was saying to us. Uh, you know, when we had, when when he was asked about him, Tim, is that uh, yeah, just that kind of a guy is just. You know, we'll line him up wherever we want, and you, you figure out where he is, and you try to deal with him. Jet sweeps. Now, uh, according to Pro Football Focus, he caught he had 80, 61 of his 86 catches in the slot. I mean, now 5'9", a little bit slight, he projects more as a slot guy, but still, that's 25 catches not out of the slot. So you can still line him up outside sometimes and just let him, as Salas said, blow the top off a of defense so he can get vertical. He's not just going to be a slot guy. He can, like like he said, he can run the jet sweep. He could do, like you said, he could do so many different things where this is a guy, like you said, they haven't had that guy in a long time, where you have to account for where he is. You know, a Tyreek Hill kind of guy. And I think that's that was one of the themes of this draft. If you want to talk about the whole draft is everyone's looking, okay, where's our Tyreek Hill? Where's that guy where the other team says, you know, how, where is this guy? We got to find this guy on the right. field. And make sure we cover this guy because if we don't, that could be a seventy-yard touchdown. And he same thing with Tony with the Giants. And but yeah, no. And, li- and listen, and as far as that stupid thing he did in the Egg Bowl a couple of years ago, I think he's. I think he was contrite. I think he moved on from it. I think the Jets checked him out. I mean, I'm not going to give a guy a scarlet letter for one thing when he seemed to uh, move on from it. And listen, 86 catches in a 10 game, you know, and I mean, well, he yeah, had the bowl game too, but still. 86 catches in a short season, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, the, number, the numbers were impressive. And they 11 catches. Impressive. And I know it wasn't a vintage Alabama defense, but we'll tell that to Justin Fields in Ohio State. But 11 catches and 12 targets against Alabama, wow. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's against, you know, that's against first-round draft picks. <laughs> exactly. That's against, yeah, secondary that's usually pretty good. Well, the D. Milne, well, D. Milne was good in college. He then just broke down when he got to Wow, well, yeah. Um, just talk about... I, I, I don't want to say that the Jets now have a, a formidable passing game because I think that would be a stretch. But how much better do you think the Jets' passing game will be this coming season? I mean, they've certainly made a lot of additions, um, aside from the new quarterback, who you have to hope learn. And that's the other thing I want to ask you before. Um, I, I don't expect Wilson to be a day one starter, but did Douglas address that point or did, or did Salah address that point? About when when they expect him to be the starter? Well, they, uh, they yeah, they 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 kind of uh, uh, tiptoed around that. They really uh, didn't 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 really address that. They they didn't say he would be yet. But I, I just let's face it, there's nobody else on the roster. I mean, they don't have anybody on the roster who's thrown an NFL pass. I mean, everyone's talking about them grabbing Nick Foles as uh, yeah, as a mentor, whatever. Would you really be could, would you really be uh, enthused with Nick Foles starting the opener? 
I mean, let's. I, I'd rather have Nick Foles start the opener than a, than a kid who's not ready. <laughs> you know, but I, well, you know, you make a good point. You make a good point. I mean, that's that's another thing. I, I don't care the fact that he won that Lions game. I and I think I told you guys this back then. I think that was another thing. I think they rushed Darnold into the starting spot to sell tickets. Yeah, absolutely. That's and why I don't. Want, that's why yourself. I don't want to do the same thing with no, Wilson. That's a fair I don't no, that's a fair point. And by the way, we're not even talking. I, I think the guy who's got a chance to make the team is uh, he, he played for them as a transfer last year. Uh, one of uh, I don't miss one of uh, now Blake Moore's teammates, Kenny Aboa, this tight end who they signed as undrafted free agent. So okay. I think turn over the tight end room a little bit. Although don't give up on Herndon. I know he he was terrible in the first half with the dropsies, but he got better in the second half. So don't give up on him just yet. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I think the offense should be better. And, and again, we haven't even talked, like I said, the first Michael Carter, he, he doesn't have great straight line speed, but quickness. Okay. Which as they say, he can get to the outside. I like that pick. If you remember, I mean, I, I was saying right before he got picked, I said, Hey, Michael Carter looks like a good fit here on Twitter. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, I was just marrying, because people, I couldn't believe some people were saying they should have the other back from Carolina. He doesn't fit the system. And that's what I thought was smart here. They would take yeah. value picks and they were taking guys who fit what they wanted to do. And that was the problem, guys. When they had, you know, when two years ago when they drafted and they had Gase and McCagnan, McCagnan, like, whatever you think about Gase, and we know he was terrible, but McCagnan was taking guys that didn't fit what Gase wanted to do, which was stupid. And then that was that was a, a big part of the problem, and that's that's why no, none of it worked. Yeah, um, I mean, Douglas and Sal are on the same page, is what I'm saying. And, yeah, and, and that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, uh, well, hold on a second, brother. Anyway, you are going to do a half hour update. Oh, go ahead. Uh, you're listening to ninety point three WHPC, the voice of Nassau Community College, from the press box on your radio or your listening device. Uh, this show becomes a podcast later at nccradio.org. Spotify, the iHeartRadio app, among other places, Apple, Apple uh, Podcasts also. So um, just to let you know, we're talking with J.P. Pelsman. He's the Jets beat writer for Forbes.com. And uh, J.P. has given us insight to the draft that happened last week. Though I have to say the first night is took so long in the second two days, they're like not even paying attention. You know, it's like they're not even showing the people... It is, it is a blur. And, you know, I, one thing, I mean, I thought it went on too long. It was four hours. I th- it was scheduled for three, um, at least on the, which, on the which schedule. Night? The first night. First night. So, oh, the first night I mean, is always a disaster. I know. But my, my favorite part is when, uh, you know, not Jets Giants thing was when the, it was in Cleveland. And when the, the Steelers were up, to, uh, the next pick, uh, the entire place starts booing because, you know, they just <laughs> don't like each other. It was nice to see because, yeah, one thing I love about the the NFL draft is all the super fans who show up, and the ones who and, you know the old days used to be in New York, so it was all Jets and Giants fans, and they're all suicidal and everything. And and the, you know how many times well, a lot they, of times for good reason. <laughs> yeah, how many times do they scream? Why did you pick him? And you know, or at least they flip out like, no way. You know, it's it's I'm, I don't like that they switch it every. year. I know why they do it, but I wish it was always in New York in a small crowded room. Where everyone's on top of each other, but obviously this year it's different. But um, anyway, JP, uh, I just want to ask a question about um, one more question about Zach Wilson. Compared to the last two guys who have played his position before, um, each each of those guys, Darnold and, and Sanchez, um, you know, they they sort of came in the same way. You know, the high hopes and oh, he's going to be our new leader, and, and that didn't happen. What? What can what are the Jets doing to make sure that doesn't happen to Zach Wilson? Well, like we talked about, I mean, they got the guard here. They, 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 they. I think they're more set up front, and you know, I just think they have a better, a better hierarchy now. I'm sorry. I mean, I think they do have a better GM in place than they've ever had. They've had in a long time. I mean, I'm not putting. I'm not saying Joe Douglas is, you know, name whatever great GM you want to name from the past. I mean. Bobby Beathard is always the go-to. Uh, Bill Polian, if you want to mention him. George Young. Yeah, George Young. No, George Young, sure. Uh, but, I mean, this isn't, this isn't uh, John Idzik with Geno Smith or, uh, you know, Mr. T, Mr. T, 
Because, uh, <laughs> you know, listen, Mike Tannenbaum, you know, and, and, and I like Mike Tannenbaum. We got along. But I think Mike Tannenbaum was a lot better. I mean, Vernon Golston aside, when Eric Mangini was helping him make the picks. I mean, Eric Mangini helped on some of those early picks. Yeah. And and that can't be forgotten. And once he was kind of out of the picture, and we know, listen, McCagan was just a disaster. I mean, there's no other way to, around it. Again, good guy, but, you know, I mean, not, just, not not good on the draft. No, not good on the draft. Plain and simple. There's no other way to put it. Which was amazing for a guy who scouted colleges for 20 years. I mean, I, but you know what? Some gun guys, when they get in that chair and they're, I mean, I think he took a lot of bad advice and wasn't good enough. Wasn't good enough in that chair to sift the good advice from the bad advice. But again, right. you don't wait until somebody gets in that chair. Put it this way: you look at the Eagles right now. And I think this year they had a little better draft than last year, from what I can gather. But you ask Eagles fans, I think they would rather that Joe Douglas was still in that room. I mean, let's put it that way. I think, again, he wasn't perfect. And listen, I didn't like – the only thing I didn't like about this trade, I know that Veer Tucker, it, again, he's earmarked for greatness. He, like Tim said, he's as close to a canvas as there is. But let's face it, this roster uh, had more holes than, than the plot line in a Marvel movie. So we'll see uh, – <laughs> You know, we'll see. You know, but and and corner. Let's face it; they still don't have. I like Bryce Hall, but they don't have a number one corner right now. I mean, I don't know if there's going to be a Richard Sherman reunion, but he's at the end of his career anyway, and he probably wants to go someplace where he can win. But you know, they're going to have to coach up one of these corners. Maybe Bless Austin, who's still on the roster, but I don't know. And they don't have a slot corner right now. Maybe it's the other Michael Carter. Maybe they re-sign Brian Poole. There's a lot of moving parts still here, and they didn't get a fullback. I know that sounds like an afterthought, but this offense is supposed to have a fullback. Right. So, you know, there's a lot of holes they still have to fill, but there's there's time. There's there's time. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they make a run out of Sherman only because Sherman was 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 so uh, complimentary about Sala and, and loved playing for him. So I would it wouldn't surprise me if, if, if they make a, if they make a run I, for I him. I definitely think I, he's I don't know how much he'll help. I mean, he's like you yeah, said, and, he's, and, he's at the end of the line. And I definitely think he's on their radar. The question is. Does a team that's got aspirations of going to the playoffs to run at him? If not, I mean, if there's no other chair left, to, you know, left when the music stops, then I think he's got no other choice. Right. If he wants to keep playing, obviously. If he wants to keep playing, yeah. And but yeah, I mean, there's no question that relationship is a very good one. Yeah. Uh, talk about, I mean, the Jet. There were plenty of picks late. Uh, Jason Pinnock, out of, uh, cornerback out of Pitt in the fifth round. Uh, Hamsa, uh, yeah, I don't even know what his last name is. Yeah, uh, Hamsa, we'll just say. Yeah, Hams, Hamsa, Nasir Rildin, uh, linebacker, I guess, or I guess they're calling him a linebacker out of Florida yeah. State. Yeah, th- both those safeties will be converted to linebacker, yeah. Okay. Uh, Brandon Eccles, out of, a corner out of Kentucky. Jonathan Marshall, a defensive tackle out of Arkansas. Uh, I, I mean, I, I think Hamshaw has got a chance to be good, but I mean, is is he the guy who you think out of those four turns into somebody who can make an impact? He probably does. Like I said, the, the one thing again, I'm not trying to. I, I guess I am nitpicking. It just bothers me because he's the one where two picks ahead of of ahead of him, uh, Joe's old team, the Ravens, kind of uh, did an eBay snipe. Now I don't know if he was on their radar or not. They got that full this fullback from Michigan, Ben Mason, who would have been a perfect fit, mm-hmm. but. But yeah, but Hamsa, he's the guy from Florida State that had an ACL tear, and, so, wow. and everyone says that if not for that, he would have been a much higher prospect. So he could be like this year's Bryce Hall of Virginia, a guy who had a devastating leg injury, but if not for that, would have been a much higher prospect. I, I think again, you know, everyone makes the joke, uh, you know, first quarterback. Yeah, it's true. He's the first quarterback. Obviously, they've taken from Pitt since Darrell Rivas. Obviously. He's, near him as a prospect. <laughs> but Pinnock is interesting <laughs> just because now okay, he's he's kind of I mean we'll we'll go into the wayback machine here. Uh he he's kind of got uh the Elvis Patterson gene, you know, it's like all or nothing. Oh, that's not good. <laughs> no, but I'm just saying there's in, there's interesting if you can get him coached up. Okay. You know what I mean? Because yeah. he does have ball skills and okay. that's hard to teach. Now, if you could get, if you can coach him up and get him to where he recognizes better or improves his technique to where he's not getting beaten as much, all skills are hard to teach. You know what I mean? If you can pick off, pick the, you know, pick, get picks or at least, you know, deflections, 
that's harder to teach, I think. That's just my opinion. I'm believe I'm a secondary coach. But and Eccles is just like he was one of those combine guys. He just blew up at his pro day. But the the this is weird though, guys. Evidently the scouts say his hips are kind of stiff, which is odd because he's got a great vertical, four three five speed, but his hips are kind of stiff. And the problem with that for corners is now I'm getting to like again to do a mic reference who you know, like you low box, you know, like right. you know, the, the inside baseball stuff. The problem with stiff hips for a corner is you can't make directions. Right. Which that, obviously a cornerback needs to be able to do. Kind of a problem because you don't know where you're going. You, the other guy does. Right. Uh, all right. Well, let me ask you a qu- another. Let me ask you a question, JP. And, and it's about the Giants more than the Jets. Uh, I know you're the Jets beat writer for Forbes, but you're also an observer of the NFL. Were you shocked that the Giants traded down their pick? Um, and what they got? I think, it was, I think it was a great move, though. I mean, again, that guy sounds like Tony just sounds like uh, again a great pick, and I I like their second pick a lot. Although the question about the medical, because again, I'm not going to try to pronounce that name either. But I, I was that was a guy I was looking at the Jets to take. Although, I, like I said, I don't know how bad his his knee is, but that guy, if if he's healthy, he could be a big time pass rusher. Oh, Aziz Ojolari. Yeah, yeah. I learned his name the other day. <laughs> <laughs> he but yeah, he's. I mean, he's a, he's a guy that that apparently they were thinking about taking at twenty, and then I mean, and then he, he falls to them at fifty. I mean, that's that's. Was, I mean, all the mocks not, had him around where the Jets were originally picking. Right he, around 23, 25. 20 25. Yeah. Pick. Now, if the if he stays healthy, this guy could Ojolari could be a big time pass rusher. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, that could be a, a steal at 50. Yeah, apparently there was some kind of talk about uh, some arthritis in his knee from, uh, from an injury or something. That's, that's, that, I guess that's why it's helped because that's what basically, uh, again, we're going the way back machine. If you remember uh, D-Rob, Dwayne Robertson of the Jets, that's what basically, now he was a different position. He was inside where you're getting pounded on every play. Right. Here you're tackled, but he had bone on bone arthritis, and that's what felled his career. Wow! Man. But play with that, <laughs> as an edge rusher, you're not getting pounded, you know, on your knees every play. So we'll see. Right, exactly. It's it's Tim, one more question for JP. We're running out of time. Uh, well, I mean, just in terms of, I, I know that everybody was kind of amused by this, but the whole Michael Carter thing, Michael Carter. Uh, a and Michael Carter. I guess it was his, is his real name Michael Carter the second. Is that where he's going? Or is that just what well, that might be the help, that might be what helps us. The Duke guy goes by Michael Carter the second, and he actually said he he did. You know when they played, he tackled him a, a couple times. Although he said that he he admitted they had one time he got by me and got the best of me. My joke was that uh, I'm surprised it wasn't like Star Trek when he tackled him that the the universe didn't implode or something. Exactly. <laughs> Anti-matter, same, same, matter. same matter, same matter can't occupy the same space. Exactly, exactly, like that Lazarus episode. <laughs> but I mean, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, the running. I assume the running back will will more than likely have a, a, a more of a role. I mean, you were saying, kind of saying that before. I'm not sure what the what the second one, the Duke guy, has, but no, they both could because that Duke guy he does play safety and he could be in the mix uh, for. Slot corner. I mean, he's out of the corners they got. He's the one that might, I would think, would have the best odds. Not great odds, but unless they re-sign Brian Poole, who's still out there, he might have the best odds of playing this this year, I would think. Okay. Slot corner. Well, JP, we appreciate you stopping by, as always, to talk about uh, the Same draft of the Jets. Uh, Jets look at it, and, and hopefully uh, for Jet fans, uh, this year will be their year. Uh, so we always hope, uh, <laughs> we, and we never get succeeded. But we do hope I that think- in the fall that uh, you'll be able to go back and cover the games actually at uh, at MetLife Stadium and you know end this uh, and thing. Do, and, you do, can- and do one on one interviews. I think they're yeah, on the yeah. way up. I do think they're on the way up, guys. I think they're. I think they're. I, I think. I think things are getting better for them. We'll see what happens, but it's it's a pro- as as coaches always say, it's a process. But I think they're in the right going in the right direction. I think this is the best coach management GM team they've had in a long, long time. Great, good, good Agreed. point. By the way, JP, we hope you've gotten your shots. You know, we've gotten our shots. I hope you get your shots. You know, fully vaccinated. You know, 
totally vaccinated. Yeah. Good to hear. Good to hear. So anyway, thank you, JP. Thank you. Uh, JP, where can they read your articles? You. Uh, uh, Forbes.com. Forbes.com, as always. Thank you so much. Yes. Okay. Thank, take care, JP. Take care. You guys too. Take Bye-bye. Care. Thanks, JP. Thank you. Thank you. JP Pelsman, uh, Jets beat writer for Forbes.com. And uh, thanks for the insight of the draft and everything. Brother, let's talk about the Yankees. We have about 10 minutes left. They're 14 and 14 now, and they've won five out of the last six. They're at 500. How about that, brother? All the, uh, the Yankee remember, fans. Remember, were... just a, remember just a couple of weeks ago, brother, everybody was panicked. The Yankees are 5 and 10. People are going out of their minds. It was fire scary. Aaron Boone. Fire Brian Cashman. Fire everybody. Fire George Steinbrenner if he, if he wasn't dead. They, they wanted everybody fired. And now what happens? A couple weeks later, Yankees go 9-4 and four in their last 13. They won five of their last six. The pitchers are doing the job. The offense is doing enough to win. You know, I mean, the thing is, brother, the thing you have to remember, all right, Luke Voigt still isn't here. He's coming back pretty soon. He's got maybe another week or so. He's already working out down in Scranton, Wilkes-Barre, uh, which that, that gives him another power bat and, and, and a better bat than, than you know maybe some of the guys who have been uh, underperforming. Um, Aaron Judge just just really just started hitting. Um, Giancarlo Stanton pretty much just started hitting. So the bats are starting to wake up. Maybe some of that uh, you know little Joe Boo magic. On, on the bats, you know, have to wake what up. Magic? Bats. Joe what Boo. magic? Joe Boo. Joe Boo. Joe Boo from Major League, bro. Come on. Oh, 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 oh I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know? I, thought that, I thought that was a new thing for bats. No, it, 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 well, it's an old thing for bats. But, you know, a little, little, that, little, bit, of, little bit of that Joe Boo magic, wake up bats. And, and, and we're finally seeing the bats waking up. The pitching has been fantastic. I'm not going to say too much about the pitching in the last three day, three games because it was against the Detroit Tigers who, who were striking out at a frightening rate. But Garrett Cole, six shutout innings, 10 strikeouts uh, against, uh, against the Tigers in a 10 nothing win. Then Jamison Tyon pitches well and, and, and gets his first win, is 6-4 over the Tigers. And then Corey Kluber. Was outstanding. He was the Corey Kluber of old. He was Cy Young well, that's Corey, what you Kluber. Want from Corey Kluber. Eight you know, shutout innings, two hits, ten strikeouts. Thank you very much, Corey Kluber. Eight innings, just like you love it, brother. Eight innings, right to Araldis Chapman. No seventh inning guy, no eighth inning guy. They're not necessary. Corey Kluber got to pitch those innings. See, Rob Leonard is correct on this. Get you know. it done. Corey Kluber pitched phenomenal. So the starting pitching is getting the job done. And and even the bullpen, for the most part, is getting the job done. Yankees pitching is 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 right up there among the tops in the league. They just as soon as the bats get going and the bats have already started to go, this this team will will you know will turn into a juggernaut. But the panic is over, thankfully. I mean, I, I was I'm so tired of, of, of well, reading, there's nothing you know, worse reading idiots on Twitter. I mean, uh, suicidal Jet fans lead the lead the league in New York and suicidal fans, but the Yankee fans that are suicidal when they lose a couple of games are maybe just as bad as the Jet ones. No, of no, course, suicidal Met fans are constant. Um, exactly, you know, that's just, that's the big issue. You know, big issue. So, so anyway, speaking of the Mets, brother, they're at five hundred. They're eleven eleven. Um, had a weird game over the Phillies <laughs> with a, a home couple, run. That a couple of weird games back. over the Phillies, brother. Yeah, I a mean, uh, it was uh, the game. The game uh, last night what was crazy. Uh, they 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 scored a couple runs uh, late. Pete uh, Pete Alonso uh, hit a smack the bases loaded double into the right center field gap, brought in three runs, and and we all thought that hey, this one this one is be an easy one. But uh, then your boy Edwin Diaz came in and made it uh, made it more than interesting uh, <laughs> instead of easy. So Dang- dangerous should be his nickname, and not for the good reasons. Well, yeah, that's call true someone too. dangerous. Very true, but uh, you know he 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 gives up uh, a shot to Reese Hoskins that uh, everybody in Philadelphia thought was a home run, and when they went to the replay, they saw that the ball bounced off the railing. They, they, the Phillies have like a fence above the outfield wall, which I don't even understand why it's there because the outfield wall is is more than high enough on its own. But they put this railing there, and the ball hit the the top of the railing and bounced back into the field. 
So the umpires took a look at it. Hoskins thought he had a home run. He circled the bases. He's in the dugout. The umpires do the the whole uh, you know headphone thing, and they're listening. And then they they point at second base and they say, "Hey, Reese, you go to second base because you didn't score. It's a double. It's ground rule double." And Hoskins just started freaking. He went nuts. He's dropping f bombs left and right. And and it's like the call is correct. Like, why are you mad? The call was correct. It was not a home run. And then uh, Edwin Diaz had to leave the game because apparently his back stiffened up while while, while the inning was going on. And and, and shock that it's, it's the most surprising thing to me was that Juris Familia struck out Bryce Harper to end the game. Wow. Mets now, win, now Mets I got win. a question about the homer, brother. If yes, it's but, above the fence where they use, I guess, to be a homer, why wouldn't that count, even if it hits something? You know, well, it it's, hits, it's, it, it, there is, like I said, there is a, 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 it's a, it's kind of a fence, I guess, above the outfield wall. It's like a, it's like a little, like maybe two foot fence with a railing above it. I don't know why it's there. It looks bad. It, it, it doesn't really, to me, it doesn't serve a purpose. Well, maybe I think what does, the Phillies, like, the Phillies should do, brother. I, I, I hate to cut you off. Is right. maybe establish a taller wall or or a shorter wall. I think of like uh, the Fenway, uh, the monster, the green monster. You have to hit it over that to get a home run. If not, it's off the wall and it counts. Right. But no, the outfield so, wall out there is more than high enough. You know, yeah, I mean, that's the, why the, 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 the Mets, out, the Mets outfielder wide. didn't didn't even make a jump for the ball. That's how high the fence is up there. I mean, it, it, he there's no way the outfielder would have caught it or could even come close to catching it, but. For whatever reason, that that little second fence with the, with the railing is there, and the ball hit the railing. Right. I mean, put it no. put it this way. Put it this way. If he would have hit the ball two inches farther, it's a home run. Literally, literally two inches. That's how close it was to being a home run. Well, I think if I'm the Phillies, I uh, I I fix the wall so you don't get that again. You know, well, you know I don't I don't get that. Luck. I mean, I, dumb luck. <laughs> eat, 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 eat one more weedy, and 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 that ball goes over the fence. Well, this this no. could be this could be uh, good luck for the Mets for the rest of the season. It's always something like this that sets a team off, you know, for well, like a run or something. We'll see. Know? The Mets are the Mets are now eleven and eleven, which uh, ties them with the Washington Nationals for first place in the National League in the moribund National League East. That's a bad division right. right now. Nobody, yes, nobody, it is. nobody's old, nobody's over five hundred. That's terrible. We'll take it. We'll take it. By the way, yes. the Knicks. Have won eleven out of twelve. They're playing really next? well as a team. Uh, they are definitely going to the playoffs. Uh, they're going on a six uh, six game West Coast trip, which I yeah. am a little worried about. Yeah, um, started well. They started yeah uh, yesterday with the win over the Houston Rockets, so that's a good start. But you know, bad yeah. team, but a good start. Yeah. Uh, but then you know, then they go the Suns, Grizzlies, Nuggets, Lakers, Clippers. That's that's, that's a tough trip. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me. If uh, you know, if, if, I mean, if they can go five hundred, they go three and three on that trip. That'd be a great trip. I would, I would take that. And the Nets, of course, you know, doing great. And uh, we just wish that all three of their superstars can play once on the same time on the floor. And and uh, but they're playing well. Otherwise, you can't stop them. Yeah, well, they've lost their last two in a row, brother. But uh, no, you know, that doesn't. They're kind of they're kind of cruising to the playoffs. Anyway, brother, that just about does it for this edition of From the Press Box. Coming up next at ten o'clock, Big Ed Newlands. With the Good Gold Show, we'll see you next week with more sports at 9 o'clock, 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock. Then, like we said before, the show becomes a podcast. Wherever you get podcasts, Spotify, Apple, et cetera, et cetera. Thanks to Sean Novak for keeping this on the air. We'll see you next time, and bye-bye.